Good morning, everyone. And welcome not only to the first Spark Summit in Europe, but the first Spark Summit outside the US. Apache Spark has come a long way since 2009 when we started it as a research project at the University of California, Berkeley. Six years later, it's a humbling experience to be here to see all this excitement and to see the profound impact that Spark is having on the way enterprises are processing big data today. Over the past five years, we have worked with hundreds of companies to run, which run Spark in production. We collaborated with all major Hadoop distributors and big data vendors. During this time, we have seen and learned a lot. Today, I am going to talk about two use cases of Spark, which we are seeing more and more in the industry. Use cases which are changing the way the enterprises processing not only big data, but also small data. The first use case is unifying or combining a diverse set of data sources. The second one is unifying data processing, including batch, streaming, and advanced analytics. These two use cases enable enterprises to get more value out of their data by helping them to implement more sophisticated data processing on a larger and larger number of data sources. Next, I am going to talk about the first use case, unifying or combining diverse data sources. Today, enterprises want to process a more and more diverse set of data, including social media feeds, users' logs, and machine logs. Typically, this data is stored in different formats, in different data stores, and at different locations, for instance, on local clusters or on the public cloud. Now, the traditional solution to deal with these multiple data sources has been to build a data warehouse and then ETL the data from each source into this data warehouse before processing this data. One problem with this solution is that you need to, to create, to build an ETL pipeline for every data source, which is an expensive and, and uh, time-consuming proposition. But an even bigger challenge is that there's the time it takes to ETL the data into the data warehouse can be long. Actually, many enterprises ETL the data, their data, in the data warehouses only once every 24 hours. And as the number of, of data sources increases and the volumes of data increases, this process is only going to get slower. This delay negatively impacts the value the enterprises can get of their, from their data because in many cases, this value is directly related with, with how fast these enterprises can make decisions on, on their data. To address this challenge, we are seeing more and more companies leveraging Spark to build what we call a just-in-time data warehouse. In a nutshell, Instead of waiting for the data to be ETL'd before being processed, Spark enables enterprises to access and process the data in place. For, in for instance, by pushing queries to the databases, by reading on-demand data from data sources like Hadoop, HDFS, and S3, and by processing the streaming data as it enters the system. Therefore, we no longer need to wait to, for the data before starting to process it. Furthermore, this solution requires only touching the data which is required by a particular query. So it scales much better with the increased number of data sources and the volumes of the data. In addition to that, 
Spark caches data and takes advantage of data locality to significantly increase the speed of data processing. Thus, by eliminating the ETL, the ETL st stage, just-in-time data warehouses enables enterprises to process the data within minutes or even seconds since it is it's being produced. This leads to much faster decisions, which can dramatically increase the business value for enterprises. To put this transition from traditional data warehouses to just-in-time data warehouses into perspective, consider the following analogy, watching a video over the internet. One decade ago, it used to be that you had to wait for tens of minutes or even hours to download the movie before you could play. And before that, you actually had to wait for the DVD to be mailed to you. And if you don't like the movie, you have to start this process all, all over again. Fast forward, and today, the majority of video over the internet is streamed. What this means is that when you click on the play button, you need to wait only for a few seconds for the first segments of the video to be cached, and then you start playing while in the background, the, video, the rest of the video is streaming. No need to wait. Similarly to the early days of the internet video distribution, with traditional data warehouses, you need to wait for the data to be ETL'd before you can query it. And similarly to the way video is streamed today, with a just-in-time data warehouse, you can query and process data immediately. No need to wait. More and more of our customers leverage Spark and Databricks to build these just-in-time warehouses. Consider a top three media company, one of Databricks customers. This company has four data sources, a traditional data warehouse to store customer transactions and customer profiles, S3 to store click streams and historical logs, Elasticsearch to store user reviews and comments, and Kafka to stream online events. This company has used Spark to build a just-in-time data, data warehouse on Databricks, which integrates all of these four data sources and provides real-time analytics. This is a use case which was not possible before with the existing solutions. Now, handling a large number of data sources, it's only half of the equation to turn data into value. The other half is processing this data. Today, enterprises have a variety of processing requirements from batch to streaming and advanced analytics. Spark is a perfect platform for this as its versatile execution engine and the ever-growing set of libraries provide support for batch for everything, for batch, streaming, interactive query processing, machine learning, and graph processing. We are seeing more and more companies taking adva advantage of this unification to build their entire data platform on top of Spark. In fact, as Matei has mentioned earlier, 70% of Spark users leverage two or more libraries. Now, to illustrate the value of this unification, allow me to give another analogy. The evolution of mobile devices. This evolution has three distinct stages. The first stage is characterized by the apparition of the first cell phones, which provided a capability which was not ever available before. Make a call from anywhere. The second st stage saw an explosion of specialized devices which targets different use cases. You have a cell phone to make calls. You have a PDA to take notes. You have an MP3 player to listen to music. You have a GPS device for directions and so forth. And as you know, the last stage has seen the emergence of the iPhone, the first smartphone 
which unifies the functionality of all these devices. This makes a smartphone much easier to use and manage because you need to deal with only one device, you need to learn only one API, you need to learn only one UI. But what truly makes this smartphone special is that it enables applications, new applications which are very hard or not possible before. Examples, if you remember, the first message application which came with the iPhone, which allows you to retrieve and listen to the messages out of order, casual mobile playing games, and better mapping application. Like if you know, it's Waze, it's a crowdsourcing mapping application. And in this, in, actually, in this particular last case, it was very hard to do it before, it's impossible. Because you have different devices, ones to send the SMS messages, messages and the other is GPS devices. Put these two together. Good luck with that. Now, we do believe that we see a similar evolution in the big data space. Hadoop provided for the first time a new capability, and that was the ability to process huge amount of data cheaply on, co on, cl on commodity clusters. However, soon people needed more than batch processing, and they started building a variety of cluster computing frameworks for different workloads. You have Storm for streaming, you have Impala and Apache Drill for interactive query processing, you have Mahout for machine learning, and so forth. Now, we believe that the no next logical uh, step are systems like Spark, which unify the functionalities of many of the systems which were developed before. And like the smartphone, we believe that this unification will ena enable new applications which are hard or impossible to do before. Just to give two examples here, consider interactive queries on the streaming data and online machine learning to build applications like instant fraud detection. It's very hard to build these applications with the specialized systems. Why? Because every functionality, streaming, interactive query processing, and machine learning, are built and provided by different systems. And then you need to move the data between these systems. This is expensive and takes time and makes this, some of these applications I am talking about infeasible. Finally, consider a, another database customer, a large online service company. This company leverages Spark and Databricks to unify both data sources and data processing. In particular, this company leverages Spark's interactive query processing and machine learning capabilities to integrate data from three data sources, S3, Redshift, and HBase. And is doing so to provide data analytics for a product management team and ad advanced predictive analytics to deliver new services. An example of such new service is user comp user cost customized inventories. And now, the highlight of the keynote, the demo. So the next demo will illustrate both the unification of data sources and the unification of data processing. The demo will be delivered by Hussein Falaki, who is a data scientist and software engineer at Databricks. Please join me to welcome Hussein. Good morning, everyone. Today, I'm going to show sentiment analysis with Spark based on examples of our customers' applications. And I'm going to demo how you can use Apache Spark to unify different sources of data as well as, as, well as different workloads in a single application. In my demo, I'm going to uh, ingest data from 
three different data sources. I will read data from HDFS, which is a distributed storage uh, system, and Redshift, which is a data warehouse service offered by Amazon. I will ETL data from these two sources using Spark SQL and construct a training data set, which I will then pass to Spark's machine learning library to build a classifier. I give the classifier to a Spark streaming application to score live stream of tweets, which is the third source of data in my demo. Um, OK, so let's get started. So I open the, the Databricks uh, workspace. And this is where uh, we run all our Spark applications. I have asked our data engineering team to dump uh, tweets for the past few days. And they have been doing so and storing them on an HDFS cluster in JSON. So as a first step, I am going to uh, read and explore the data. So for that, I'm creating a notebook. And I choose R uh, to explore my data, uh, primarily because it is the latest addition to Spark and Databricks notebooks. But you can do this exploratory analysis in Scala and Python as well. So let me zoom in, zoom in a little bit to make sure everyone in the back can see, <coughs> can see my code. <coughs> Excuse me. So as a first step, I'm going to uh, read the data from HDFS. And use Spark's JSON data source to parse them. This is very convenient because it, it relieves me from having to write a custom JSON parser uh, to read my data. S Spark's JSON data source will scan every record and construct the best schema that accommodates all of them, including data types and nested fields. Now that I get a data frame, I can register it at the temp table. Let's call it tweets. And since it's a table, I can use SQL to explore my data. I'm going to take a look at the first few rows of my data to get a sense of what it looks like. OK, so as you can see, we have several columns. And some of them are nested, like this user column. But in this demo, we are primarily concerned with text features. So I'm going to uh, extract that column. Before that, let me import a library called MacReader that will simplify my syntax and construct another da uh, data frame. using this pipe operator that is enabled by the library that basically consists of uh, the lowercase text field. And I'm adding two more columns. The first one, I'm calling it, is happy. And it's a flag that is set when the text field contains uh, the happy smiley face. And a second column that is very similar. And I call it a sad, which is going to be set when we see the sad face. And since I'm going to be interacting with this data multiple times, I cache it. Now, I'm going to ask Spark to materialize the cache by counting the number of rows in my data. So now Spark will fetch the data from, from HDFS and construct the two new columns that I just created and keep it in the memory of the workers in my cluster and also return the number of rows. As you can see, we have about 70 million tweets. But I would like to know how many of them have either of those two uh, um, uh, smiley faces. So I perform a simple aggregation and count to get the numbers. 
And when I display it, I can see that I have about 6,700 tweets with a happy face and only about 500 tweets with a sad face. If I look at the ratio of these two with a simple pie chart, we can see that we have a little bit more than 10 times more tweets with the happy face than the sad, the sad ones. So this is interesting, but it is important for us because if you want to use these tweets to construct a training data set, we need to make sure uh, that we balance the number of positive and negative examples. That's why I'm going to filter the happy tweets and sample them by about by 10% and get all of the sad tweets with no sampling. Now I can um, merge these two data, data frames. and register them, the, the merged data frame as a temp table and call it tweet data. OK. Uh, now, I'm going to repeat this process for the second data set that I have access to to hopefully get uh, more examples. So I will clone this notebook. The second data set are product reviews stored in Amazon Redshift. So I call it reviews and attach my notebook to the cluster. Because I don't want to uh, reveal my passwords, I'm going to run a notebook that populates some uh, uh, environment variables with my passwords. And then I am going to use Spark's Redshift data source to read data from Redshift. Right after that, I will uh, I ca call cache on my data frame and ask Spark to count it so the cache gets materialized. The Redshift data source will connect to Redshift and fetch all the contents of this table called reviews. And since I've asked Spark to cache it, it will be stored in the memory of all the workers. So subsequent actions against that data set will be much, much faster, and there will be no need to access Redshift again. And this is fairly common when accessing exter external data sources. So you can see we have about 2.5 million product reviews. So I'm going to get a peek at the data to see what it looks like. And as you can see, we have an ID, the review text, timestamps, and ratings. Again, we are only interested in text features here. So I changed my old query to get the review column and then run the rest of my notebook and get the ratio. So here we see that there are 17% of reviews with the sad, uh, smiley face in them. And this could be because when people are paying with money for something, they're more likely to use the sad face in their review. Um, so this means we've got to change our sampling ratio to balance the data set. So I do that and register this as a new table called review data. OK, now that we have training samples uh, from both data, data, data sources, I can start building my classifier. So now I'll create a new notebook, call it sentiment analysis. And this time, I choose Scala, uh, primarily because the machine learning team at Databricks has already written a notebook in Scala for sentiment analysis, and I would like to reuse their work. So I connect my notebook to GitHub. to fetch uh, the revision history and uh, switch to the latest version of the, their notebook and GitHub and, uh, and retrieve it and then get the notebook. This notebook expects to get its input data in a data frame called data, so I just construct that. The first table, and I uh, merge it with the second table, and run it. So we get a new data frame. Now I can run all the commands in, no in this notebook. And while it's running, explain what it does. The notebook is pretty simple. It takes uh, the text column and tokenizes um, the words, and then counts the frequency of each word 
and then uses those frequencies in a regression model to build a classifier that identifies the contribution of each word to positive and negative uh, uh, sentiment. So uh, the process is done, and we have our model here. At this stage, we would usually perform uh, cross-validation to assess the performance of our, uh, of our model. But I'm going to do something uh, slightly more fun for the demo. I'm going to give my uh, model a few uh, example sentences and see what it predicts as a sentiment for those. The first obvious uh, sentence I would like to test is, uh, I hate that. And I expect it to have negative sentiment. So let's see if our model can get that right. So that's right. If I change that to the opposite, something like, I like it, I expect it to be positive. So it is positive. Um, I actually uh, would like to use this to uh, get uh, the opinion on other topics. For example, the US elections is going on. So I was curious about one of the candidates. So let's see what our model thinks about that. Ah. And uh, naturally, I wanted to try this one. And it's different. So our model seems to have its opinion about, <laughs> about elections. But let's get to what we wanted to use our model for, which was scoring live stream of tweets and uh, identify uh, social media sentiment about our brand, for example. So I'm going to run another notebook that defines a function which will start my Spark streaming application. When I, when I call that function, I pass it the model that I just built and a keyword that will be used against Twitter's API to fetch all the tweets that match a given hashtag. So for this demo, I'm going to use the word coffee. And this will start the, the streaming application, which gets the tweets and applies the models on all of them, and then stores the resulting scores in a table, which is uh, called score tweets. So now I can query this table in SQL. And here are some examples. So uh, there is a happy one. We need help with volunteers. And there's a sad one. Grab your coffee. We see you have there. You see you, see you there. So I would like to do some frequency counts to actually get like an aggregate, uh, uh, aggregate estimation of the sentiment. So I run this uh, simple query. It basically counts the number of happy and sad examples for each time interval. And I convert it to a graph and configure it to show different lines for positive and negative sentiments. OK, so this is uh, the summary. But because I want to share it with everyone else at my company, I'm going to create a dashboard and call it sentiment dashboard. So our graph is now available in the dashboard. And because I wanted to refresh to, to refresh itself automatically, I configure the dashboard to refresh every three seconds. So this will become a live dashboard. And here we are. We have a live dashboard of tweets that mention the keyword coffee. And we can see whether, at any time, the sentiment about it is positive or negative. And that shows how we could ingest data from different data sources use them in multiple components of Spark, and then uh, build a, a, an application which uh, gives us the answer to the questions we were looking for. Thank you.